Excited to welcome Head of Development for Ice Hockey Club, EVZ, in Zug, Switzerland, Ted Soikinen, to the Basketball Podcast. Prior to moving to Switzerland, Ted was the Head of Development for HC Locomotive of the KHL in Russia. During this time there, HC Locomotive was able to get 18 players from their junior system drafted in the NHL. Ted started his coaching career in the USA before moving back to Sweden where he played professionally to continue his coaching career. He also holds top education through USA Hockey and the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation, as well as a master's degree in neuroscience. Ted, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I really appreciate it. So uh, why am I talking to a hockey guy? And well, number one, I love hockey. But uh, number two, uh, you know, hockey is an invasion sport like soccer, basketball. You know, it involves an offensive team working to maintain possession of an object, in our case, the ball, your case, a puck, uh, while attacking uh, or invading a defensive team's space. So uh, talk to us a little bit more about how our two sports are connected and particularly with the focus on what an invasion sport is. Well, I believe like... Um... The, the main principle, I think, like when you looked at the old Chicago Bulls uh, back in the 90s, uh, Phil Jackson's triangle offense and all that. And uh, every time we look at hockey, we're always trying to create triangles uh, for support, whether that's the primary triangle, which means the ones that are the closest ones to the puck, the two other uh, guys without the puck, or the secondary triangle, if it's going to come off of it on a different way sitting there with five guys on the ice and uh, you're always looking to have that support. And I think that's the same thing. Like when you're looking at basketball is where the faster the ball moves, the quicker the defense gets out of uh, position and the, and the pace of the play gets uh, even faster. So in that, in that realm, I think we're, we're very similar. I think as well that we're very similar to the fact nowadays where there's a big explosion of skill coaches um, per se out there for hockey. And it's all about the, we call it the dingle dangles, right? Uh, how cool can I be around a cone and how many different tricks can I go? And then when you're looking at basketball on the flip side, even though I don't follow it that in depth, but the game of basketball has changed to being almost more individual. And what, what's the style that you can play compared to what's the team style? So I think we're we're very similar along the lines about how how things have evolved um, through the years. But the one thing that I believe uh, that we have in common as well, and I think that's for all invasion sports, whether that's soccer or um, American football or whatever. But you know, the the better we can play as a team, uh, the better the product's going to be on the ice as well. And I think that we need to always get back into the areas where we're working on cognition, passing, moving and moving in the right areas another area that we are very similar and by, by the way just so people know the reason you're here is because you add incredible value uh to my coaching and to everyone's coaching that follows you with all the sharing that you do online but the other thing that we have in common is resistance resistance to the fact that playing hockey improves you at playing hockey or playing basketball improves you at playing basketball and you reference trainers but i would say coaches are still the same that they believe that these pylon drills actually are the key part in the beginning stages or in the later stages of developing hockey or basketball players. And that simply isn't true. We cannot dis disconnect the decision and the perception action coupling from the player. And if we want them to improve at the game, can we? No, not at all. I think uh, looking at both sports, uh, once again, is that growing up in Minnesota, <laughs> the land of 10,000 lakes, we had frozen ponds all winter long. And a lot, outside, you always had kids playing. There was never a coach or an adult that was present. But, you know, you had us playing when you could be nine years old on the rink and then you got a 16-year-old on the rink as well. And you're learning how to survive. And you're learning how to keep your head up. You're learning how to do all these different things that you weren't conscious about. They were just happening because you are part of that environment. And the same thing, I had good friends that played basketball. We always played street basketball uh, in, the, in the alley back home growing up. And... I didn't know a single rule about basketball per se. I didn't, you know, how to dribble the ball correctly or how to make the, the Allen Iverson double dribble, whatever you want, the crossover dribble. But you always did it by watching, imitating, and then it would just emerge sometimes without even trying it. But what happens now is that um, we are decoupling everything. So we're trying to break down skills to their smallest parts. And then we're hoping that the athlete is able to actually be able to go out there and put it together for themselves when the situation calls for it. 
But the problem that happens now is that we're really starting to see is that um, because my background's in neuroscience is that we're putting everything into conscious memory. So what happens is that if I go to a skill coach today and he's trying to teach me how to do a toe drag or some kind of Connor McDavid move, all of a sudden I'm going to go out on the rink and I'm going to be trying to find it and force it into place when it's not meant to be forced. Yet the problem is when he's doing it in practice, it's against an innate object. So it's a cone, it's a, some kind of apparatus that's going to be out there and they're doing rep after rep after rep until it looks flawless. But the problem is that once you get that one little variable that doesn't fit, it could be the ice is chipped away, the puck bounces, the stick gets in the way, whatever happens, it falls apart. And now we have a turnover. And what happens, the worst part that's um, happening out of all that is that the player is getting frustrated because he's putting in the time to actually work, but it's not translating over to the game. And where we as coaches uh, a lot of times get stuck in that old uh, hole from the old coaching style is repetition after repetition is what's going to give it to you because we want to have it clean. If we have it clean in practice, it means we have a good practice. That's the old thinking, right? But the problem is, and that, that looks good to Instagram. That looks good to mom and dad who are sitting in the stands. That looks good to the AD, the athletic director that's watching it. Things look good. It's timed. It's working. And passes are going. But the problem is the game's chaos. So you can't script it. It doesn't matter what sport you play. You cannot script it at all. And you can work on a five-on-old breakout like we have, and passes are crisp and they're, and they're exiting the zone. But all of a sudden, you're playing against live guys that are, are forechecking. Some are faster. Some are slower. Some are, are smarter. They're just standing around, you know. And when it doesn't work, now everybody's in a frustration mode. But what's the old saying that happens is that, especially like in the juniors and the youth, the cream always rises to the crop. So you always have those special p- talent guys that keep going up and keep going up, but they're going to go up anyway. It's not because of the coaching. It's because of a natural instinct that they have and the way that they can play and that the way that they probably play outside by themselves with other friends. But then I always look at it and say, okay, so if we have 30 guys, and only two made it, what happened to the other 28? How did we fail them? And if we fail those 28, what are we doing to the younger generations as well? So, it's it's a it's a bad mix that we as coaches need to sit down and really reevaluate uh, exactly what we're doing on the ice or on the court. And let's clarify this. You and I, it's not us. We're not right. We're just following the evidence based research. Right. Like this is okay. this is stuff that's been researched. And a lot of coaches that hold on to some of these narratives of the past or how they were coached or different things like that, to be truthful, they just haven't dove into the research like we have, but they're also not necessarily thinking, is there a better way? And like everything over the last 20 years or the last year, things have improved because there's been more research, there's been more innovation. I mean, just again, the pace of change of of society and life. And it's just a crazy situation where we have so much resistance from coaches who don't consider the fact that in the last 30 years, our ability to coach and teach and learn, apply learning theory has improved, right? But it's difficult. That's the problem. It, it's, it's easier I mean, to do to, what you've already done, right? Right. I mean, it, it's so difficult to actually go there and, and read the literature mm-hmm. because you have to be conscious. You have to be attentive. You have to be focused. And it's going to put you – I remember getting into it. It puts you inside of a – I don't know what you want to say. Inside of like a glass jar where you feel like you know nothing. <laughs> totally. And – then you start to become creative out of it. And you're like, oh, I wonder if that's going to work. I wonder if it's not going to work. And then you, you start to doubt yourself because it, it is foreign. But it's also easy to go online and, uh, you know, find a template and just put that out there, put together a practice plan and, and run it and blow your whistle every 10 seconds, right? I mean, that's easy because my job's done. But I, I think we're failing the players if we don't uh, expand our knowledge. Because both the game of basketball and both the game of hockey, and I think every game for that matter, um, has evolved over the last 20 years. And even over the last five years has really taken place with the rule changes and everything else. That we start have to start thinking outside that box in the sense where what are the players needing and what are they telling me they need? Not necessarily them coming up to me and saying, coach, I need to do this. But what are they showing me on the ice? Like how attentive can I be to be able to see 
what they actually are lacking and then create a practice based off of that and not off of what I want to want them to learn. I'm guessing your advice is the same for coaches that go into this class jar. I mean, number one, basketball immersion. That's what we've tried to do is simplify it for people. So it's one stop shopping to be able to learn this. But for us, we recommend to all coaches, you don't have to dive in and do it all at once because again, Coaching development mirrors player development, doesn't it? We wouldn't ask a player, okay, now go apply everything we've taught you. No, you're going to drip it in and you're going to slowly introduce it. But I'm guessing maybe your advice would be the same to coaches in the sense that my first thing is just make sure your practices represent more of the game than they used to. And that means play more basketball in practice or play more hockey in practice. Well, what's the biggest thing that you always hear from a coach? Well, they need this skill before they can perform that. Right. So you always hear that or they need to perfect this before they can do that. So one of my steps is like, you know, to, to interweave it. So sometimes I'm saying like, all right, especially here now in Switzerland, uh, I'm new to the club and we're really trying to redo our youth section. But I'm like, if you guys think you have a skill that you want to teach, whether it's a skating stride or, or, you know, stick out in the puck, that's fine. Do it for five or 10 minutes but then put that into a game and then give them points for every time that they perform it good or, you know, that they attempt to perform it so that they start to get that, um, that representation that this actually fits here and how is it going to fit? And if you see something else and I'll pull it out and then do a little bit of isolation if you have to, but naturally put it right back in. So it's not like you're going right off the deep end and trying to do everything like we're talking about but you can actually tease it in there once in a while so you get the feel of it. But the most importantly, the kids start to understand why they're doing what you're trying to teach them. And then from that, you're going to be able to see, okay, Hey, that kid, he can do this, but his body's a little bit different. Well, maybe that's just him. And the other kid looks like he's picture perfect from a template. So we'll leave him alone a little bit, but now let's get this other guy just a little bit more of a, you know, a nudge or a little bit of a tip, a principal tip saying, lean a little bit forward or just get your hand off your, off your body. Like there's a balloon between your body and your, and your top end. So it's like trying to get the guys to actually be able to see the game in a different light. And then when they're actually coaching the kids, how fast can I do a skill and then put it within a game like situation as quick as possible and then teach off of that and not teach from the individual isolation part. I love that. And it essentially follow the drill with action, game-based action. And uh, I would even suggest to some coaches is to play the game, do the drill, play the game again, so that they get to connect it or reconnect it to what you're saying, uh, because that's a big part. And uh, coming back a little bit kind of to where you started, which is this concept of skill. Talk to us about skill is never really acquired or perfected, because that seems to be a real sticking point for some coaches where they think this is this end process of getting this skill now it's perfect that's all because of that ten thousand hour rule by Anders <laughs> Ericsson, right Just you know, myth, yeah. every, everybody believes that so i'm going to go shoot pucks for ten thousand hours outside um at a net standing still trying to hit the corners and i can get really good at that the problem is when i get onto the ice once again i'm moving i'm not standing still two i got a goalie three i got defenders in front of me Four, I don't know what the puck is actually doing. Is it laying flat or whatever else? So when I say you never really acquire skill, you can't. You can't say you have it because every situation is going to call for something different. Now, can I, can I acquire uh, mobility and variability within myself? Of course, I can, I can create that inside myself with the technique part. But the actual skill, the skill is going to be the, dependent on what the game is asking me to do. It's also going to be dependent on what time period is it in the game? Is it late? Is it early? Is it the playoff? You know, how is the ice? Is it cold? Is it softer in the spring? Like everything's going to happen there where you're not going to be able to use quote unquote, your skill that you've always been practicing. It's going to change over and over again. So you never see, it's like, I always call it, it's like a snowflake, right? You ne there's never a repeatable one. And skill is continually adapting. It's never the same. And uh, so talk to us then about how we should approach skill development in the context of player development, team development. Well, number one, player development, get to know your player. I mean, 
like I always say, like everybody wants to read books or they want to watch. And, you know, a lot, like the biggest thing for hockey right now, I don't know how it is in basketball, but they'll download an uh, NHL game. And then they'll just have Connor McDavid, who's the best player on the earth right now. And then they'll reverse uh, engineer all his moves sure. and then try to teach it to a player without even knowing what the player is capable of doing. If that's even his movement factors. So I always say is that the number one thing for player development is you have to really get to know who you're dealing with. How do they move? What are their habits? What are their tendencies? And then once you start to know that, how do they adapt to the team? How do they feel within the team? Where is their position within the team? Who do they play best with? Like what position are they good at? And then when we have all that kind of stuff, now it's all about spacing, time and space. And once you start to understand, I think, the player, and then when he starts to understand and understand his own habits and what he wants to do, his top skill, quote unquote, his top skills, right, is like now you can start putting that team dynamic where you can start to exploit them. And I think – what we like to do is like we like to put them basically overload them cognitively on the ice all the time. So you're putting so much pressure on them, not necessarily pressure as far as getting hit and and all that, but just stressing the constraints that you're having on the ice, whether it's with, you know, one against two, where it's normally one against one or one against zero going one against two. How is he going to adapt to that? How is he going to use this deception of speed? How is he going to play the puck? Where is he going to hide it at? And all through that, it's always going to be looking at making sure that we're videoing, that we're going to be able to get that feedback later. I think that's the big part about it is what we like to do and what we did in Russia for, for those years that we introduced there was that, that video feedback loop that the kids have. And then making sure that they have ample rest time because in the brain, we need to have settlement. And the big thing is probably the same in basketball, but everybody's about work rest ratio. Kids got to be moving. Kids got to go, 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 go. Well, the problem with that is that if they just keep going, you don't know. And they don't know if they're making mistakes or not making mistakes or how to fix them or what direction or that feedback that you need to give. And if you do give feedback, it doesn't settle in the brain for them because their heart rates are too high. The information gets a little bit too overloaded. So what we like to do is like uh, if they get a rep in, you get a little bit of a video, let their heart rate settle, let them look at it, let them sit and watch, and then put them back out into the same situation to see what they are able to do. That is true player development on that side of it. But it's always for how we like to do it here is um, and how I like to work with the players. I call it skeletons. So I'll work with a skeleton based off of, we group our players into similar attributes, similar habits. So if it's like the right wingers, they all like to do one little thing on the ice in certain areas. I'll group them in that. If it's a left defense, they'll have their own defensive uh, side points. But the skeleton is like, let's look at the movements. Look, let's look at the options, the pre-options that we could have, like the patterns that we could create. So then they get familiar going into those like patterns quickly, three, four reps max. Slow speed, you know, nothing over just to let them feel it and not let them feel the edges, let them feel how their body moves. And then the individual tactic comes in. Now you put the defenders put in place. Now you put the constraints in place where they're going to have to go and live it. So maybe they're going to take two of the different patterns that we came up with and mash them together possibly. Or they're going to come up with something completely different that's 100% okay to solve that solution but everything's on video so that you're going to be able to critique it with them, but they're going to have to give you the answers, not the other way around. Because I always talk about, there's a good movie out there. I'm not, I can't say it's not the greatest movie, but it's called vantage Point. Hmm. I think it was Dennis Quaid and uh, Forrest Whitaker and them. And the movie is always about, it's the same movie, but it replays itself three times. And the three times it replays itself, it's all from different eyesight. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I always hold myself back and I try to talk to our coaches about is withhold feedback as fast as you can. Do not blurt it out. Force an answer out to the player. 
not an open, like make sure it's an open-ended question that you're giving them, but force out an answer because what they see on the ice is completely different than what we see because they're going to be in the action. So we don't know if they saw the defenses, the defenseman's hips move one way and they tried to go the opposite way. And it was just maybe a tactical error where the puck didn't go with them because that was the right decision. We don't know if they saw that. All we saw was the mistake. So we want to get to know what was in their head, why they did what they did. And that's the same thing at Vantage Point. That's, that's that first Vantage Point is them. The second one's our view. And the third one's obviously going to be the camera. That's just a little bit up to show time and space because obviously the court and the ice uh, the ice sheet looks like it's completely wide open when you go from the top. So I always tell them we give them three uh, the three Vantage Points that are in there, but we have to let them answer. And the more comfortable you get with talking to the players and probably the most important part is that once the player understands that you actually care what they say to you and you take their word, then all of a sudden that communication, it just flows. And it's, it's a couple seconds only compared to the first time where it could be a minute or two minutes. So I, I love that. I love that vantage point example. That's a great, great way to be able to connect it for yourself as a coach. And uh, you, you talk a lot about problem solving as well. And uh, if we want to think about, let's just think this pylon dribbling or the stick handling drill, there's no problem solving. So why is it important to have drills or situations that present problems for a player? And coming back to your, que- to your point that you just made about asking an open-ended question, also this connects to the fact that is our answer the only answer? And that's how coaching sometimes exists in this way of saying what my feedback is, is the way you should do it. Whereas the player's pro- problem solving may have been better than mine anyways. Well, let's, let's take a look at first um, the pylons, right? Yeah. So when you think about how the brain actually works, it doesn't take it. It doesn't take itself long to reorganize your body movements. So if, if you're going to do a station, um, I'm sure it's the same there, but like here we'll have, like I say, an hour practice, you might have five stations. So you're basically in a station for 10 minutes apiece doing the same drill over and over and over again. Well, actually, after probably about three, four reps, the brain turns off. It knows what's going to come. It knows what's going to do. And like I say, is that what's the most important piece of the body that they take away with cones, your eyes, Mm -hmm. your eyes are the primary feeder of all information to the brain. If your eyes aren't seeing what they should be seeing, then your brain's only going to do what it was meant to do. So now you've just trained the player to one look down as we all know in hockey, we get hit, you know, and it, it can be bad. So we, we're training the players right off the bat to, to keep their heads down and to keep their eyes up on the ice because they're looking at the pylons. Two, we got no brain activity happening, cognition. Once after about four or five reps, once the body has been able to reorganize and go, now you're just in repeat mode with no cognition, nothing happening upstairs. So we have to 100% be aware of how can we engage the eyes because how much information can the eyes take in? And with that is the decisions that are coming out of it, right? Because if I tell a kid to go left and right and left and right, yeah, it looks nice. It looks smooth. But, you know, we all have those kids <laughs> that we've been with that no matter how many times you show the drill, which way you want them to go, that one kid's still going to go the wrong way, always. But then I always ask the question, is he wrong? And usually it's not because he's wrong that he's doing it. It's the thing I've understood is that he can't learn from doing it that way. He has to learn from doing it his way. And number two, they usually go to their, their strong sides. So now how do I get him to go to his weak side? Well, usually now if I put a guy standing there waving a stick at him, what's he going to do naturally? He's going to try to protect the puck. He's going to escape from that. So now he's having to decide, he's having to be creative inside of that, yet he's not consciously thinking that I'm going to my weak side, where if he's in a standalone drill, he would. So like the decision-making and and the eyesight, we have to be able to train him in in that sense because in in our game, it's so fast and that puck changes direction so quickly. Same thing in basketball can happen, right? 
fast breaks and everything else that you're trying to do, set screens, whatever's happening, that ball movement. Well, the decision's got to be as quick as possible. What am I going to do? And what we like to do, like I was talking earlier with the skeleton part, is we'll work on the skeleton one, one against zero to start with just to feel patterns, but then we'll add a teammate in. And the teammate's in there going into open ice. But he's got to read what the defense is doing to the guy with the puck. And then the puck carrier's got to see what kind of deception he can actually do to get both defenders coming at him to actually open space for his guy that's going into space. So as you can see, there's a lot of coupling that's happening all over the place. And when we're talking about, like you said, their ideas usually are 100% better than ours because we've seen it 100 times. This is what we're, we're drilled into and how it should look. Yet the, cre the, the creative part is that that's what makes the game beautiful. And I believe, and I think a lot of people believe this right now, is that we're, we're driving the creativity out of the players. We're making a robots. I think it was a messy quote that you shared that basically he was expressing that, that we don't have creative players because we train them all the same, right? That we put yep. them in these rote memorization drills and then we expect them to now be creative. And I hear it in basketball coaches all the time. Oh, you know, players don't know how to play the game anymore, blah, blah, blah. And it's really, isn't it all coming from this lack of creativity, lack, lack of challenge, uh, you know, lack of self-discovery, problem solving, because we don't put them in those situations. We don't put them in situations where they have to develop those things and where there are multiple possibilities in terms of those solutions. 100%. I mean, I think, um, like you said, like now we have $1,000 academies that kids are going to. They're going on travel teams all over the place. They're doing everything, and that's usually your cream of the crop players. And all they're training to do is just trying to train to be the best that they can be, but not in the sense where they're going to fulfill their potential in the sense where they're going to be the best they can be at 14 years old, only at 15 years old and not seeing down the line. And uh, the biggest problem is, is you have to be able to harness the chaos. It may not, it 99% of our practices don't look pretty yet the activity that's happening between the ears and the actual talk you hear the guys expressing on the ice, though, that's where the real learning is happening. Because what happens now is like what we're starting to see is that like you can hear the chatter on the ice. When they're not going, they're talking to their teammates. And what we like to do, and that was another one I forgot to mention too, was that have the defenders talk to the, talk to the offenders or the offense players. Um, and, and meaning taking a forward and making him a defenseman as well and vice versa, taking the defenseman and making him a forward and then having to play one-on-one -on -one or one against two or two on two in different like uh, constrained areas. And then having the, if the defender, he has to give the feedback back to the, uh, the offensive player. And what he's got to give him the feedback is I was thinking you were going to do this, but my feet were turned here and you still went there. So now he's trying to give that feedback about what he was actually thinking and how to defend it. So now you're having the players teach each other within the same concept. Because now if, I, if, if I'm the defenseman, now I give the offensive player a, a, a little bit of a key point about what I'm trying to do, and he tries to get it, it's only get, get me as a defender better because now I have to defend differently based off of what he's going to be giving me. And then also the other part about it too is like we have sometimes um, have another guy instead of him just waiting in line, have him follow the offensive player. And then he has to give the feedback about what he saw to the guy that was with the puck. And then they can have their little bit of a discussion about how they could attack it differently next time. So it's always about trying to open up that communication yet as a coach, taking that step back and allowing it to happen. As long as they stay on track, and they're not going to start talking about Tinder or other stuff on the ice, but as long as they're staying on track with what we're doing, the communication part is probably the biggest part where they're going to be able to go, especially the peer learning of it. And you reference this many times in, in different <clears throat> situations, but you, our goal is to create independent performers, isn't it? 100%.
And that means us as a coach, we need to step back and we need to allow for that to happen. And, uh, you know, and, and to a certain extent, I imagine part of your role is to somewhat redefine for coaches, administrators, parents, et cetera, what coaching actually is. Because I think we have this Hollywood version of what coaching is, where we're, you know, this, this, <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about right away, but the Al Pacino, right? Yeah. Like Any that's coaching. Sunday. That's not coaching, right? Coaching is actually the ability to remove yourself and only act in situations where they need you. When we play a game, who's playing? When it's a real game out there, who's playing the game? They are. Not us as coaches. And we haven't got the technology yet where we as play, as coaches have that PlayStation controller on the bench where we can control the players. So they're actually the ones between the between the boards that are playing. And um, they're having to act on their own to solve problems. So as a coach, I have to be able to, and that's what we talk to our parents, um, we have to be able to empower the players. We have to give it to them. We have to give them that power. We have to allow them to solve problems. We have to allow them to communicate and, and find solutions for so many different areas because that's what's happened on the ice on every single 30-second shift. But if we don't empower them and they're always looking for us for the answers, when one small piece breaks, there's nothing we can fix. Yeah, we might bench the kid, right? I mean, that's another part that they like to do. They like to bench the guy. Yet you know, what does that solve? Well, what happens is it doesn't solve anything. What happens is it makes the kid even more scared because he knows I just made a mistake. What's going to happen next? I'm going to play simpler and dumber. So I don't make another mistake, but now I'm, I'm a non-asset on the ice. So basically we got five against four out there. So instead of actually, you know, that old tactic where you can scare them by benching them and scare them by yelling at them, instead of that actually raising them, it puts them down even further. And now you're just starting to make a ghost out of that player. What he once was, he's no longer there. And that's what we have to talk with parents a lot is that, you know, it's, um, it's not us. We're here to help your kids educate. And that's why we're coaches. Coaches are just like teachers, you know, and it's like um, the biggest thing in hockey right now, they're saying you can't teach hockey IQ. It's the, well, I'm sure it's the same in basketball. It's the right? same. I, I, yeah. So if we can't teach it, if it's, if it's just born, then why do we have coaches? Yeah. Because if I have hockey IQ. And that's I'm your value as a coach, it, isn't it? That you can teach that. Because you, you know what they can do on their own? They can stick a handle on air on their own. But your value 100%. is you can help them connect those skills and decisions, isn't it? hundred percent. And that's where we're looking at like that, you know, redefining what, like what a coach is. You have to be able to sit there and figure out a way to teach it. And if, and even if you're a volunteer, the kids are still paying money to be there. The parents are still spending time. It's free time. And time is the most expensive thing that there is. So even if you're a volunteer, like we have volunteers in our club, I tell them, I go, if you're going to volunteer for this team, then you've got to put in the time as a full-time coach to actually figure out solutions and how to teach IQ because everything that we do on the ice, just like everything that every time a kid goes to school, he should be learning. And it's the same thing on the ice. He should always be learning. How does this fit into the game? How does this fit into the structure? How does this fit into me? And then that's IQ, right? That's awareness. That's how you're trying to figure out how moves work. And the more, like we talked about before, the more little small area games, the small area individual tactics where there's pressure, there's decisions to be made, that's constantly building IQ. And it has to be our forefront to making smarter players. So I, I want to dive deeper into the IQ part. But before that, I want to come back to something you said and connect it for our audience. And because I've heard you talk about this before, the coaches are problem solvers too. And you reference, say, the player that doesn't get a concept or the player that potentially coaches might phrase as uncoachable. But really, you've said it, and I, I agree with this, is that it's not that they're uncoachable or they can't get it. They just might not get it the way we're trying to present it. So they just need to be coached differently. And that's our main job as problem solvers to a certain extent is finding the way it connects with individuals, right? 100%. You know, some are visual, right? Some have to, like, you can draw on the board. They're going to be able to see that. 
others you you have to show it but what i've what i've noticed and we did it in russia we started doing it in russia we we brought it here as well is that um sometimes kids learn the best from their from their peers so if you have that kid you're always going to have that within your teams you're going to have that kid that really understands everything quick and he's always going to be the one that's raising his hand to answer the questions that you're asking and all that well, if you see that kid that can do that, have him explain it. Have him explain the drills or have the group come up with the concepts that you're going to have. Because now that kid's no longer being like just stimulated as far as the kid that can't get it, uncoachable kid. He's no longer being told what to do. He's now part of the group to solve the problem about how do we do it. So if they come up with their own drills or they come up with the concepts that they feel that they're weak on, or you put him in charge of stuff. And I think that's where, like, that's the empowerment part, where that's just another part to our toolbox where now we can see, and that can actually probably break the barrier between you and him to open up the lines of communication. Coming back, you we referenced just a few times about the brain being disengaged, because that's another part that kind of you've said a few times, and I can't agree with more. The reason a player's brain is disengaged is usually because we've created an environment for their brain to be disengaged, isn't it? Yep, 100%. So let's dive into sticky practice, because I know you've shared this as a concept, and let's go some of these things that lead to sticky practice. That means players are learning and they're engaged, and it sticks with them beyond just that one practice. Uh, because I, I just find the way you said that is wonderful. And there's some different ideas that go with it. So uh, I'm going to share one of them and then you can talk about it. Then I'll go to the next one. But this concept of don't try to replicate the game, distort it. I love that phrasing. How can I distort the game? Like what, what kind of concepts? Like we have um, here, uh, you've probably never seen it, but it's like a oversized puck. So it's kind of like if I play basketball, I could take like one of those little mini basketballs. It's, it's distorting it a little bit. Hmm. Or... We we take the we take the big um, the big puck, which you can't just flick with your wrist because it's too heavy. So now you got to use your body. Now you can't skate as fast. So what happens? You have to be able to actually slow yourself down, find the people that are going into different areas, or we're going to put them in just situations that will never happen in a game. Hundred percent, right? So you never have two against five coming into the corner because that would just be stupid in a real game. But what am I trying to talk? What am I trying to teach the guys with the puck? Right? How do we, how do we protect it? How do we use the space? How do we use the boards? So you just try to just completely take the game that you actually would see and distort it to a sense where it's still relevant, but they're having to use different, different parts of their body, different parts of the regions of their brain for communication and everything else and vision just to try to solve the problems that they're within. So so a constraint like shrinking the floor would be an example as well, distorting the game, right? Something simple like that. They can only play on this side of the court or this side of the ice, right? Right, or something like you guys can only yeah. play inside the key. So where this connects for me, and you've said it many times, is that we have to redefine somewhat what fundamentals are that we have to redefine what a fundamental is because we think again a fundamental is stick handling but you've said it many times fundamental is fundamental is finding space or taking away space finding advantage and keeping an advantage or taking away an advantage and you said that in that five on two drill that that's an example of that you you have a disadvantage but you got to find a way to make it work so these are actually the fundamentals that these type of distortions help bring out aren't they correct and then i ask you the question what is a fundamental Exactly. Right. I mean, it's, I, I heard. To um, me, space is a fundamental. <laughs> Finding it. It is. Taking it away. I can't remember. Uh, I follow him on Twitter. I think you do too. He's from Sweden. He's from Ireland, but he, he coaches uh, soccer in Sweden. Mark. Oh, Marco Sullivan. Marco Sullivan. Yeah. And I, I listened to his podcast the other day and it was like, I, I came in here with the smile on my face to talk to the coaches. I was like, why do we use fundamental? Why don't we use functional? Mm. I mean, that makes more sense because like he said, and it makes complete sense. What's fundamental to me is going to be different to you. Yeah. It's a finality to a fundamental. And that's why we don't use those words either in our world, because again, it's like, it implies there's only one solution. Correct. 
And it implies that you have to put everybody into that same box. Exactly. And like I always talk to everybody is like, I go, um, physics tells you that a bumblebee shouldn't be able to fly, but it does. It's wings are too small for its body. Everybody talked about Wayne Gretzky saying he, uh, he was not a good skater. His skating, ter- he was skating terribly. His lean was too bad and everything else. Yeah. But, uh, he also broke every single record in the NHL. It worked for him. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you look at all these different things and you look at like Kobe Bryant, he was talking about, I listened to something like he was talking about before where his hands were too small. They weren't as big as MJ's and his vertical wasn't as good. And this wasn't as good. And that wasn't as good. Well, what did he work on? He worked on getting himself better, but it was always within the play. Right. And then it was always, he shifted everything towards how he was supposed to be. But then he also knew what his identity was. He knew what his drawbacks were. But he knew what his identity was so he could exploit his strengths. And that's where I, I don't think um, – I think that's the biggest part in coaching is that we don't look at players good enough to really find out what their strengths and weaknesses are. We start labeling too early. Oh, he's a good skater. He's a good shooter. He's this. Oh, that kid, he can't do that. All right, he's done. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Same thing in basketball. Oh, he's probably too slow. Yeah, yeah. All the time. dribble to his left, right? And it's not that they can't do it. They just can't do it yet. Or they haven't found a solution to their reality. And we've gone to using a lot of words like this is your reality. If you're tall, you're short, you're slow. It's not a weakness. It's a reality. So now we have to find solutions within that. Of course. And that's where you, that's where you start to tailor things for them. Mm-hmm. Right? Muggsy, Muggsy Bogue should never have been an NBA player as far as fundamentally speaking, right? He was too small. <laughs> everything Absolutely. else but but i i think he had a pretty good nba career yeah uh sticky practice number two make mistakes there's no perfect practice think perfect effort hey if you look at a kid gives you everything you can see that he's giving you everything he has to try to do something and he he can't get it or he keeps falling or it just doesn't work out for him yet Like you said, yet. What else can I ask from him? He's giving me everything he has. We're just trying to find a solution together. Um, And I don't want perfection. Because the second he gets perfection, or the second he gets it, it's got to change. And I got to keep making him uncomfortable and keep making him uncomfortable. Because it's a little bit frustrating, but you give him that little bit of a success and then you take and you instantly change it, what he's going to be able to adapt to in the game. Because that one-on-one, that two-on-one is not going to be the same like I talked about before. It won't be the same, but how do I practice it? Right? So that perfect effort always has to be there. But that comes from me as a coach, first and foremost. That means I'm showing up to practice in a good mood. I'm smiling. I'm joking. And the second he falls, the second he fails, I'm right there with him, patting him on the ass and saying, hey, don't worry about that was a good effort coming inside there. So you're always trying to keep the confidence levels up so that they keep trying to do what they're trying to do. I've said said this on the podcast a few times to different coaches, but we'll, we'll go to the point that we'll tell players great effort in making a mistake because the whole goal is to free them. You know, because you've talked about it already, you've referenced fear. A lot of players don't aren't the best version of themselves because they're always scared. And most of that fear comes from making a mistake and then the transactional part of making that mistake. Uh, so I l- but, love that aspect. But when we go to the mistake part, right? So what is a mistake? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if, well, falling, you, you referenced. <laughs> Right, but that's not a mistake. I mean, that, no. that that just happens, right? It's it's not like you tried to fall. Right. Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. Because I tell the coaches all the time, are, are they trying to make miss a layup? Are they trying to throw a bad pass? Like, no, they're not trying to do those things. <laughs> I think it's humanly possible that none of us want to trip over the curb. Yeah. You know, yeah. none of us don't want to score the goal or make the pass. Like, we don't try to make the mistake. It just happens. <laughs> And when I talk to the players, it's like we, I have a year, like two times a year, we have individual player meetings and I give them a, I think it's like 10 questions. 
uh, and they have to answer these and they have to write them out and they have to be in depth with them. It's a very holistic kind of view about what's your lifestyle, you know, your social life, how do you take care of yourself, all these different areas. And I would say a 99% of the things, one of their fears are, is making a mistake. Mm. And then when it gets inside of a game, like their mental, their mental image inside of a game, if I make a mistake, I fear that I'm going to make another mistake. So I always ask them the simple question after they read this with them and we go through it. My simple question to them always is, um, is a game of hockey mistake free? And they're like, no. I go, but if it was, if the game was, and it'd be any, it'd be any sport actually. But if the game of hockey was mistake free, what would the score be? They go zero zero. I go right. So goals happen off of mistakes, right? I go, but if if we're always making mistakes, then how does one team always win, or how does one player always overcome them? And I don't know. He overcomes them because he forgets about it. Hmm. I go, unless, unless you're Marty McFly and you got the time machine to take me back, you can't fix it. You can't fix that you fell. You can't fix that you missed the pass. You can't fix that you missed receiving the pass. You can't fix that you um, missed the net with the shot. You can't fix it. It's over. It was a moment in time, but you've got to overcome that. And so I think that's where we have to be, like you're talking about when we're in practice. That's where the mindset has to come from the coach. That's where we got to be that driving force and being like, hey, let's go. Yeah. No problem. Let's go. Pick yeah, it up. normalize it so that it doesn't become a big deal. Exactly. Yeah. Just like raising a kid, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that's a whole nother podcast for us someday. Um, <laughs> third part, sticky practice, use interleaving, mixing, I call it. I'll give you an example today. I have a really unskilled under 12 team at my my daughter's middle school. Uh, may not played basketball before, but we started playing basketball to, at practice today. And then we went to this on-air layups. But when we did the on-air layups, they did one step, two step, and then dribble. So they were mixing it rather than doing them in repetitive of one, two, or three. Then we played basketball again, and then they did the layups again, and then we played basketball again. So we're mixing it, and talk to us about why we're interleaving. It's a success rate to give the players confidence. A lot of guys, I mean, you can go off the deep end on, on the way that we think on this and be like, well, the game's the best teacher, so just let them play. Well, yeah, it is a good teacher, but you're, you're a coach, so you got to be in there to give some kind of feedback stuff and everything else. And if you're trying to exploit and really harness in um, a skill or a decision or trying to get that space and time uh, concept down, sometimes you really have to break it down. And you got to get that success, uh, that success rate up a little bit on them so that they can build that confidence inside themselves so they can actually feel it. What does it feel like to succeed on this? But then you really got to put them right back into the mix of things. And then you got to highlight when they do it. So that's like when we play a small area game, for, for instance, if we're looking at area passes, right? So not tape to tape, but just putting the puck into an area and that your teammate's going to skate into it. We get points for that. So for every time you can do that, you get a point. And sometimes we go like, say, two points. And if you tried to, it didn't work out, you still get a point because you tried it. And, and ultimately, we're trying to stimulate this retrieval practice, right? That they're, they, they're on the verge of forgetting it, and then they have to retrieve it, and they have to yep. come back to it. And that's what leads to stickiness or this permanence in terms of learning. And it's not – you don't get that from this blocked on-air memorization, right? Because the brain, as you've referenced all the time, is disengaged. No, 100%. And I think with the interleaving of it, um, when you're looking at that, it's also that same point where I brought up before where you're going to be able to get settlement because when you can break it down and go back to the first step, you can review. Yeah. And now all of a sudden your reps aren't as quick and you can actually take your time and try to feel how the movement is going or take your time. And like, if I want to make those area passes, what's the pressure of my stick on the ice and how, how am I touching that puck coming off of it? So you're being able to feel it and that, that helps get back into that memory where it's starting to create that sense that you're going to need on that stick and on your hands later. But that's where, you know, over back and forth, over back and forth like that. After a while, like it's, 
that space and time thing for us in hockey, it's like the, the puck carrier isn't the central figure. It's the four other guys without the puck. So how are they moving into space, right? And so that's why we like to give the, the, the points. Like sometimes we'll say like it's a two points for a conversion. It'll be one point if I'm the passer and I put the puck into an area where, Chris, you should have gone, but you didn't go. Mm-hmm. So I still want to reward the guys, the guy that gets the team that gets the point, that guy that actually made the pass. I made the pass. I get the point. Hey, you know what? It does work. So now Chris has to, now you have to start to think, Hey, that was open space. I got to get there. And how do I find out and figure that out? So then all of a sudden they start to talk and they say, Hey, if I'm moving this way, try to look that way. We'll try to redirect them with a little bit of deception. So now, you know, like these little things, like if you manipulate the points as well, and then you put them back, like you say, into like a, a blocked situation, and then you put them back in, it really starts to, the concepts really start to solidify. And then you start to see it translated to the actual game. I love it. I mean, use of points uh, in terms of a constraint to shape learning is, is so powerful. And, uh, you know, and the other thing with the constraints, and you can talk about this with, say, the point scoring system is, one of the challenges is that, and I get asked this question a lot for coaches that use it, is what happens when players learn how to cheat the constraint? Because basically they learn how to game the game. And to me, that's a good thing, right? If they start, start yep. to learn how to game the game. So talk about that a little bit. No, we have it all the time. because they're, yeah. <laughs> we're, And it's good because they're being creative and they're trying to find the hidden ways to, to game it. And we like it, but we wait till it happens. Exactly. Yeah. Like we know we're sitting there and like I, a couple of coaches are like, yeah, but you know, if they put the puck over the line, then the puck's going to go, ah, just, just wait. We didn't say anything about it. We'll, we'll see if they pick it up and we'll let them go a couple of times. Then all of a sudden we'll just say, all right, we'll switch up the rules quick. Mm-hmm. And if you, now, if you do that, if you have possession of the puck, because we have one game, like you put the puck over the goal line, you're going to come back the other way. So you're having the other team back check. So your passers are near the goal you're trying to score on. So it's kicking back the other way. So instead of going the whole way, they'll just dump the puck there and then take off. Mm, okay. So then we'll be like, all right. So they, they start to do that. We let that happen a little bit. And then we're like, okay, change the rules now. You kick that one out, the other team gets the puck. Plus one of you, the guy that kicked it out has to sit out. So now it's a three on two for five seconds. So now you get the advantage to the other team. So now they're going to say, oh, okay, here we go. Right? So – Love now it. you take it away. And, <laughs> yeah. and and even we just sometimes just to, to game it for ourselves as coaches to keep the, the, the score competitive. It's like the kid's close to the line. It bounces off his stick and it's out. Like, hey, should have controlled it. You're out. <laughs> so now you just make sure that you're going to put them really into that presence of mind to be conscious of what they're doing out there and not be lackadaisical. Well, the other thing I've been sharing, which you just highlighted there, is that consequences don't have to be running. They don't have to be physical punishment. They don't have to be benching. You just gave them natural and logical consequences to something. Oh, you you, you have to, say, touch the line before you get back in. So it's a three on two temporarily. So you're removing right. yourself from the play or you're, you don't get to play offense. You lose possession. These are natural and logical consequences that should be enough to be able to, again, connect the ideas that you want them to be able to replicate. And why, uh, growing up, I remember we always had to skate without pucks. Oh, my gosh. Same yeah, enough. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are doing the lines, right? Oh, my gosh. But, like, in basketball, I'm not sure what you guys pay per hour in a gym cost. Yeah, but, significant. I mean, hockey is significant. We know that. <laughs> hockey is, like, 300 bucks an hour right yeah. now. Yeah. So I look at the guys, like, you, you see them, like, okay, line up on the line with skate. It's like, <sighs> what? No. So you, we're paying 300 bucks an hour to do this? No. Put them inside of a game, into a competitive game, and like you're saying, you, 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 you take away privileges depending on what they do. And they're going to work harder trying to do stuff while they're having fun no. playing. The conditioning is going to come and everything else. Plus, the other, the other good part about that is like when you're playing and you're controlling the, the time frame of the shift – as well and you can manipulate it as much as you want but the best part is is that the the longer you go in, into games a little bit as well the constraint being that you have less and less fatigue or you have more and more fatigue of the brain because less and less oxygen is going there 
which also is going to start to impede decisions, which like we always tell the guys, you can see that they're starting to get there. You're like, Hey boys, we're third period. We're game seven in April right now. It's like you motivate them in these areas. And like, that's the other constraint that we'll do as well. We won't resurface the ice mm. after the team before us. Love it. I have a coach. It's not clean. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. But there's, there's grooves in the ice, just like overtime. Like, there's so many different things. If we can get good playing in these kind of like conditions, in this kind of environment, how good are we going to be when it is clean? If we can play when we're fatigued and still make crisp passes, still make good decisions, how are we going to be when it comes to playoff when it, when it really matters? You reference overload already in that sense, and I, I love that idea of that. And then you, you talked about maximizing practice time. To me, that's the – the number one reason to not spend time on things that players can do on their own, right? Like the, you only have a limited time with them as a coach. And if they can dribble on air on their own, why are we doing that in a practice when we can spend time on them playing basketball, offense versus defense, where they can't do that on their own. And that applies to consequences, like a lot of running in practice. And I've said it to many parents that ask me about basketball trainers. So these one-on-one trainers that you referenced to, I'm like, if that trainer has you doing physical conditioning, find a new trainer. Like, well, I'm spending money on this trainer helping me get more skilled at basketball, not at running lines and stuff. And I see that still all the time, where trainers have players doing running one on oh by themselves. And I'm like, that is not basketball development. That's not skill development. And that doesn't lead to more fun playing basketball, does it? Not at all. I mean, that's just a waste of money. Mm-hmm. So you're sorry, I was just going to say, and this all connects to your fourth point in sticky practice, which is games for understanding games for understanding. So playing games for understanding, but also games are fun, aren't they? They're a lot of fun, especially when you have the, you know, like we, we always make it not from a coach side of it. Um, we either pit the defenseman against the forwards, we pit lines against lines or whatever else is going to be. And they always have to say what the winner is going to get. And then what we have is like from the coach's side of it is like we make that inner inner uh, challenge, right? So from the coach's side of it, then we give them a card at the end of the month. Like so we we do monthly monthly challenges on it. Then the winning team also gets the card at the end of the month. And that winning team that gets the card at the end of the month, they get a free pizza party or whatever else they want to do. So it's kind of like you're always instilling that competitive nature inside of them. Yet they're having fun, but they're going to try to instill all the different things that we're trying to do. And our point systems always change. It's not always who scores the most goals. It's depending on what we want to work on and what we're trying to exploit and what we're trying to get translated into the next game. But that's the biggest thing that I, you know, it it burns me. I was up in Sweden um, about in November for, uh, to speak at the Swedish ice hockey federations coaches education and one of the questions at the end of at the thing was like hey how do we make our players more competitive and I, I go well what do you mean I'm like well i got the same question know, when i went to sweden just for a reference this exact same question <laughs> and i'm like well what do you mean more competitive they're like yeah how do we make them compete yeah i'm like that's i go to me i go that's a weird question because i go as humans when we're born we're born to compete I go, I had a, my, my, my youngest and I was nine, but I remember taking them to the sandbox at the park. And there was another kid in the sandbox in the park and they're both about one or two years old. And they're both fighting over the shovel that neither of them owned. <laughs> so I go, I go, the question isn't how do we make them more competitive or how do we get them to compete? The question has got to be is why are we breeding it out of them? Mm. Because nobody wants to lose. I'm sorry. You, you, nobody does. But I think we as a coaching community worldwide, what we're seeing is that we're breeding that out of them. And I, I believe that's becoming a lot. How we're breeding out of them is because the individualized, of personalized training for all of these team sports makes them a one-man game. They don't have to compete for anything. They, they are out there and they're doing their own thing all the time. And if the only thing they compete with is whatever the coach puts on the ice for them. It's not a physical confrontation with another individual. 
Well, and the other part is obviously the lack of gameplay. It's hard to be competitive in on-air drills. It's hard to be competitive and memorize drills, right? And if your practice represents these on it, we would say three-man weave, for example, or it's just mindless passing up the floor. Yeah, you're not going to be com oh, I'm competing against a score. I got to get a score. But we know that players can game that too. They know the exact pace they got to get to get that. And if they make a mistake, it's not because they're not focused. It's because they're disengaged. So unintentional consequence of our practice design is we're creating uncompetitive situations for players, aren't we? But that, like you know, that nice thing there you get, you you referenced that a few times was the uh, three man weave. Mm. I love doing that, hockey, but I don't do it with one puck. They Overload. have two pucks. Yeah, overloaded, and then they have like you can't pre plan it. You can't go super fast. You can't just spread out the ice and do long passes. Like it's always like I I talk to to everybody like well so you're a hundred percent against uh against cones and you're a hundred percent against this i'm like no fine you, you want to work on the skill do good but i go you got 40 kids on the ice and you got 200 cones <laughs> yet only five guys are actually working yeah what are we supposed to do well for every cone that you have there put a player there yeah the player can move his stick he can make his own obstacle. He can change up the dynamic. He can change the variation. And it's like, if, if you really, if you really want to go into the isolated block practice, at least put a player there because now I have to look at your hips. Cause that's going to be my, what do you call it? My, my gateway to what you're trying to do to me. Right. Because your hands and your hips and whatever your hip, hips are going to do, your feet are going to do. So that's where I'm trying to look at. That's why I want my players, their gaze at not the chest. Down the hips, no matter what. So now put and just so you know that connects to your fifth principle, which is basically embrace chaos. And, and the advantage of chaos as well, which you've referenced, especially from your neuroscience background, you know this, is they're constantly working on scanning skills. With this chaos of having, say, every player at a cone going at once instead of waiting in a line, everyone has to search and find space, don't they? Yes, hundred percent. And that Even chaos one is guy good. <laughs> Yeah, even if one guy is actually like what we call working and he's the one that's going to shoot. And I tell him, I go, okay, so you don't want those guys standing there. Fine. Um, put them there and put a puck on their stick so they're stick handling. But they have having a move when he's coming up there. They have to move left or right. So then he's got to go the opposite way. So he's got to read it. Yeah, but what happens if they crash? They crash. Well, and, he made, and they made a bad decision <laughs> about finding space. Hey, right. I'll give you an example. I, like I, at clinics, I've demonstrated this. I've had 20 kids get a ball and all go shoot a layup at the same basket. And people like cringe, obviously. Oh, it's not safe, all this. And I'm like, okay, well, the number one fundamental in basketball is to find space. So if we don't put them in situations where they have to find space. Okay, so you attack. There's three people in your way. Don't shoot it there. Find space. <laughs> okay, or slow down or move sideways or move backwards. Find space. And that actually helps the player more than doing it on air in perfect space. Or even that other part too, is what you got the deception uh, aspect of that as well. It's the same. I, I'm just picturing in my head, like uh, MJ going down and he's going to drive and everybody's crashing in the basket. They don't want him to go. He's got a little bit of a pump fake coming up and yep. then they They're all hit the back. Take away your space. Comes... Yeah. Find a solution. He's got pretty good solutions. <laughs> oh, he has a lot of good ones. <laughs> it's all in that aspect. And, um, I think like when, when you when you look at it from that kind of a standpoint where you're you're having even those kids that are all gonna do the layup or you're gonna use kids as, as cones out there instead because they can move their stick and they can move their body, so you have to react to it. You're engaging all the senses, right? And your eyes are number one that are be coming into play. So right away you're not you're teaching the kids to have their eyes up so they can see. And now all of a sudden everything else will be able to move and you'll be able to talk to them and they'll be able to actually answer you. Well, what did you see, Chris? Even a five-year-old can tell you what he saw. Yeah. But he's not going to be able to tell you why he couldn't turn around a cone. He can't tell you I wasn't on my outside edge. My weight wasn't right, whatnot, but he can tell you what he saw. So I want to just get your thoughts here. Cause I, I know you say a, miscon a misconception of using small sided games or uh, small area games is that technique isn't developed. And this is a resistance that I hear a lot about playing a lot of basketball in practice. Oh, we're not working on technique. So can you address that for our audience? 
What's technique? Exactly. <laughs> we talked about comes full circle. We're mixing it back in now, aren't we? <laughs> no, I, yeah, but I mean, everybody's like, ah, yeah, you got to work on technique. You got to work on technique to be able to play. But what's technique? <laughs> and that's and that's where I think um, when we look at we're trying to create robots or we're trying to create individuals. And your technical aspects of hockey are going to be completely different than mine. And why would I try to change you into me or vice versa? It's not going to fit. Now, the technical part about it is I, th I like the game part because you're going to see the technique emerge from the players while they play. But now this is going to give me firsthand knowledge of who you are and what you can and can't do. And then I can work within the constraints of what your body is allowing you to do. Not change you to be whatever textbook's going to tell me to change you to be, but help you modify to be a better version of yourself. So I, I think like people say you can't find no, you have to look for it. It's not spot on in display as far as the spotlights on you. Instead, it's hidden inside the gameplay. So now how do I figure that out? And that's why I always say like the first first couple of practices in the year, small area games all the way around, and all we do is video it. Then I gotta sit upstairs and I gotta watch. Now I gotta start to pick out clues on who you are, what you are. And now I start making my plan for yourself. So, and I say to coaches, like, do we care how they score the lap? Do, or do we care that they sh shot an open lap to score the lap? And I imagine it's the same in hockey. Like, okay, do oh, we care God. that they use the Connor McDavid move or the Sidney Crosby or the Austin Matthews move? Do we care that they use that move or do we just care they made the right decision? 100%. We had a guy. I won't name his name, but we had a guy <laughs> when I was in Russia that put together templates mm. and had a, had, had a scoring system from zero to 10, 10 being the best. And it was, I can't remember, it was a template for shooting for a wrist shot. And there was eight different pictures you had to take of the kid from the video and then put a still shot in. And, um, uh, then you have to rate them based off of shooting and the shooter that they're based and everything off was Austin Matthews. Mm. So your hands had to be up here. This had to be here. Your hips had to turn here. So I go, okay, I go one, that kid's not going to shoot like Austin Matthews. So why are we? Yeah, but he has to have a goal. Okay. I go, so now each one of these pictures you're rating from zero to 10. He's a 10, but now that's all subjective because I may see something different than what you see. So how am I going to give this? How am I going to give a number value? Uh, they got to be able to, uh, to, to see that they're not so good. I go, but what if a kid is a 10 out of 10 on all these? Well, then you manipulate the picture to make it look like it's not perfect. So he's got room to improve. So then I had to, I'm like, I go, this is, I go, it's ridiculous. So we had to, I had to go and take Austin Matthews, Patrick Laine. Uh, Steven Stamkos, uh, Alexander Ovechkin, all the big goal scorers. Uh, Phil Kessel is the other guy. They all shot different. Mm -hmm. So I go, I think it was like six or seven guys I had. I go, I looked at the guy, I go, now, which one's the best shooter? <laughs> well, they're all elite. I go, yeah, yeah, they all are elite. But which one's the best shooter? You can't you, you you can't tell me because they're all elite shooters, yet their body mechanics are all completely a little bit different. Then it was the same thing. They had a, a skating template. And we're looking at that, and that goes to your to your layup. And it's like, uh, he's an ugly skater. Yeah, but he gets from point A to point B faster than anybody else on the ice. So what's what's it matter? Like, I don't care how ugly it is. Does it work? Yeah. No. At the end of the day, does he get the job done? And does he get the job done in an efficient manner and in a positive manner? And if he does, why try, why try to take his identity away from him?
Ted, I could talk to you all day and uh, I think people are understanding that. And uh, uh, just a huge thanks for coming on and sharing uh, so many valuable ideas with us. And uh, any last ideas for coaches in terms of uh, approaching some of these ideas that you've shared? No, Chris, first of all, you know, it was an honor to be out here with you and the time went by pretty fast. And like you said, I could be here all night as well. Um, you know, the biggest thing I think for coaches is, is get outside your game. Um, there's so much more knowledge that you can actually expand upon that you can actually bring back to your game. If you can step outside, like for myself, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I was a basketball fan, like, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, but I really dove into it now about like what your technical principles, your teaching principles are about how to create offense not so much the defensive side of things, but the offense and the, you know, I can't remember. I bought an old book. Is it Tex Winter? Tex Winter. Yeah. The triangle offense, as you referenced already. Yeah. It was an old book I, I found on Amazon and I got it as a spiral binding and everything. And it, it, it's just something that opened up for me. And the other, the other sport that I really look at is uh, soccer. You know, it's like get different ideas from as many different people that you can, because you never know which ideas going to be able to pop in and help you in any given moment. Just, you know, for most coaches, try to not just get pigeonholed into your own sport because you can go down a dark tunnel and you'll stay there. Such great advice and uh, so many valuable things. Ted, thanks again for sharing with us. Thank you, Chris.